Okay, here we are on Think Tech Asia with Michael Davis, who is a professor at Hong Kong University and who is visiting what? Visiting uh, the uh, East West Center. East West Center now, and uh, he's a public intellectual. Uh, and we're, we're talking today about beyond the umbrella movement because last couple of times we talked to Michael, we talked about the umbrella movement, right. and now it's uh, several months after that, and we need we need to follow up with him and find out what what happened. The, the calm after the storm, or maybe the, right. the storm after the storm. Welcome to the show, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what, what's going on in Hong Kong these days? Well, what's going on is, uh, of course, the umbrella movement came to an end late last year. And then there was a consultation exercise with the Chinese, uh, with the Hong Kong government to, uh, you know, pro come up with a bill because the whole umbrella movement was a response to Beijing's limitations that it imposed is, yeah, you can have democracy as long as we can choose the candidate kind of thing. Uh, and Hong Kong people uh, felt that was fake democracy, and they used that term, fake democracy. So the umbrella movement was driven by that, by these statements by Beijing. And then throughout the it whole... It was called the umbrella movement because everybody carried an umbrella around. To deflect tear gas that was being shot thank at you, them. Thank right. you, thank <laughs> you. Right, and, and the yellow umbrella became the symbol of, of this movement, and then people would walk or go around with these little yellow umbrellas hanging from their, their uh, keychain. And, and so, uh, yeah, and, and then what happened, I think, is it's a, it's a, it takes on several la layers, and, and the layers are that it seems that Beijing's calling the shots, but then the Hong Kong government's expected to be in front of it all. And what I think the public saw in the whole process was the Hong Kong government had no voice. That, and in fact, in many ways, the demands for democracy in Hong Kong are a result of the feeling that Hong Kong government doesn't represent Hong Kong, it represents Beijing. And so throughout this dispute, uh, a lot of moderate proposals were put forward, ways to compromise by people on the pan-democratic side of the debate. Uh, and even in the second round of discussions, because the pan-democrats boycotted the second consultation exercise uh, early this year, uh, even then at this stage, proposals for moderation were even put forward by the pro-Beijing camp. The government ignored all of those. So the message sort of became clear that this government's not doing anything for Hong Kong, that it's taking instructions from Beijing. Uh, I wrote actually an op-ed, I remember in January, arguing this, that const you know, this is an autonomous region. Uh, governments of autonomous regions are supposed to defend autonomy. And for the first time in all my numerous op-eds, the chief executive of Hong Kong's office wrote back to me, said Professor Davis doesn't understand our constitutional limitations. Mm. We defend Hong Kong's autonomy by stopping baby formula from being exported from Hong Kong and so on. It was so much so laughable. But they put this in the paper in response to my op-ed. Op uh, and so the, the sense you get is, is this is what's kind of broken. And this is why people want democracy, because they want a government that can have a voice. No one imagines that Hong Kong government is going to be out there bashing Beijing all the time. I, that ain't going to happen. You know, that, that would be kind of silly. Uh, Beijing obviously holds more cards than the Hong Kong government does in this relationship. But at the same time, I think that there's a sense in the public that they would like that government to be a voice for Hong Kong. Representational. Yeah, to represent Hong Kong's Right now Kong's it's concerns. not representational right, at all. Right, to represent Hong Kong's concerns to the central government. And what they're getting is a government that only lectures Hong Kong on Beijing's concerns. So I think if you really want to dig to the nub of the problem and why people seemingly are willing to confront one of the most hardline regimes on earth in Hong Kong. I mean, we have this image, you know, even the cover of Time magazine, you know, a 19-year-old boy, you know, leading a protest movement, you know. And why are the youth of Hong Kong worried? They're worried essentially what they see is the evaporation of Hong Kong. They see the Hong Kong they know being completely lost. Swept up into... Swept up into China yeah. and becoming just another city in China. And in their view, uh, that's not good for Hong Kong. Hong Kong is one of the world's leading financial centers. So just from a financial economic viewpoint, the world is not well served by just uh, rolling up Hong Kong. Uh, but at the same time, they themselves see their way of life under threat. And, and the promises that have been made in the Sino-British Treaty for Hong Kong being violated. So, so this, uh, it's st stunning to see this activism by the youth. So what, we have a government that seems to be looking backward now in Beijing. 
uh, Xi Jinping and his, mm -hmm. uh, the Politburo, whatever, um, the Central Committee, I, I don't know how it works, but yeah. um, instead of looking forward as we might hope and expect them to do, I mean, everybody around here anyway has been very optimistic about right. China and its future, thinking that they were going to do rule of law, they were going to do representative government, they were going to be, you know, uh, they were going to be a modern democratic nation of sorts. Um, doesn't seem like that's happening. And the question I put to you is why? Why is it going backward? Well, it seems that we have a bit of paranoia in the leadership in Beijing. They, it, they seem to be driven more in their choices by maintaining the Communist Party in power. Now, give them credit. Presumably, they think maintaining the Communist Party in power will maintain stability and order in China. But that formula works only at the early stages of economic development when you're making washing machines. But when you start wanting to make computers and to participate in a global information age and so on, you need an open society with access to information. And so what they're, they're confronting is more and more young people than, I don't know how many hundred million users of the internet in China are, are savvy and expecting to communicate freely and so on and they see this as a threat to the to the communist party's grip on power uh, and it probably is i mean at the end of the day it's hard to maintain a communist you know authoritarian regime in a modern you know de highly developed uh, society it's not sustainable it's not sustainable instead of looking for ways to climb down that could sustain cons address concerns that they have I think they've made choices that the only way to do this is sort of to put the genie back in the bottle and to, to repress it. And so now uh, they, they give instructions to universities not to use Western uh, materials it's in their going teaching. Going backward a mile a minute. Right, right. And they, they give uh, directives, a, a document they gave a couple years ago called document number nine, not to teach you know, free speech, constitutionalism, rule of law, anything in the universities. I, I have a, a amusing comment to my students. I have a lot of students from China and I teach in a master's program in human rights. And in the classes, I point out to the students, you know, this class is illegal across the border. <laughs> Everything. I mean, we don't only violate document number nine. We do, and, and the use of Western materials is all there that, as that well. That them up, yeah. yeah that's, but uh, these are, of course, students who chose to, to enroll in a human rights program, so they're pleased with that. But, uh, yeah, I think so the regime is trying to hold back uh, what it sees as a kind of corrosion of its power. Yeah. Uh, and so we're, uh, and I don't know what the solution is. It, it's like you, a self-fulfilling prophecy, though, isn't it? If, you, if right. you are trying to hold back the corrosion of your power, you wind up losing power. That's exactly right. In fact, this is what happened in Hong Kong. You can imagine the Sino-British Treaty and the basic law of Hong Kong, which is supposed to be Hong Kong's constitution, says the ultimate aim is universal suffrage to choose both the legislative council and chief executive. Not very complicated concept, you know, universal suffrage. You can have variations, but there, there's General something. General idea. Yeah. We know what it is. Yeah. Uh, and you can imagine if they just let that happen, then there would be an election. Some guy would get elected and wouldn't dare spend all this time bashing Beijing. Or he wouldn't get reelected. So they would be, Hong Kong people are pretty sensible. They probably choose some moderate, as, as Americans do. Yeah. You know, politically, that's what people do. Uh, and that would be the end of it. Oh, no, no universal suffrage. Oh, universal suffrage can mean what we mean, think it means, not what Western It's an insult thinks. to the intelligence of right. Hong Kong. Right, and all of this goes on. People go to the streets. What happens? Instead of all of China not even knowing that Hong Kong's, you know, gotten even more open and free. Everybody knows now. Everybody right, knows what's right. exactly the, world. the problem. They put up like a neon signs around the umbrella movement. And so now Chinese people are thinking, well, what's all this fuss about? You know? so it's really stuck in an earlier time. But yeah. you know, one thing, you know, we had a show about a year ago about the Falun Gong, about a woman, a journalist yeah. uh, out of mainland yeah. China who had been uh, first harassed and then incarcerated for about a year yeah. and tortured. Um, it was very, it was very frightening, uh, mm -hmm. and I, my sense of it is, that the, the, the treatment of the Falun Gong and, and what uh, political um, perceived enemies hasn't changed, and human rights is still in trouble 
in mainland China directed that, am I right? Well, it's gotten worse lately. And again, I think as Xi Jinping has, during his reign, it seems to have turned to a more repressive style. Uh, a lot of people had hoped that he would turn the page and that, you know, he because he seemed to have a solid grip on power, that that would give him the confidence to explore, you know, reforms, political reforms, because China had economic reforms decades ago, yeah. and now the pressure is on, you know, people wrote articles a couple years ago, would China defy gravity? You're kind of asking whether somehow they can keep having economic development, economic reform without reforming their political system, which is still looks pretty much like it did under Mao. And so, <laughs> so then everyone had this hope, but it seems that his perceptions were quite different. One is, he did recognize there was a lot of corruption in the part of corruption is rampant. It's almost like everybody's corrupt. even now. Even now, even, even off to talk about the rule of law and anti-corruption. Right. So he wants to fight corruption, but he doesn't want to fight corruption the way everyone knows you fight corruption, which is transparency. You open up from the bottom. You get the public to to supervise. You know what's going on in society by having a free press and so on. No, this is a sort of top-down fight against corruption. By doing that, you immediately attract suspicion. You know, is this just going after my enemies? What's going on? Okay, that's part of the story. So the, I think it's very popular that he wants to fight corruption, and he controls the press. So the story of his fight against corruption and the tigers, as they call it, that he goes after, is can be widely publicized. And I think there's a lot of support for fighting corruption. The other things is is then, at the same time, he worries about the party's grip on power, so he wants to control the internet, and he wants to control NGOs in the society. So he goes about all of this, he passes, gets new laws through to control the internet and make everybody, you know, uh, basically tell on each other, you know, who's doing what, and, and, and the companies where the student young people go in, they usually go in these, these businesses where there's rows of computers where they can go in there and, and get on the internet that these companies are held responsible for what people do on the internet. And then, of course, there's all the internet. You know, China is, is the world leader on controlling the internet with, you know, what they call 50 centers. I mean, I even get attacked by 50 centers. What is that? As people will get paid 50 cents for putting on messages on the internet to support the regime. So they, they create a message. They don't just stop, you know, they already sift for words they disapprove of. You know, so they say June 4th. Oh, that's not going to be allowed on the internet because that's the, you know, 10 on 1. So, of course, Chinese young people are very clever, so they start talking about March 30, uh, May 35th, you know. So, of course. And then, of course, then they get that. So this is, this is a cat and mouse game. So, so the Internet is one big part of the story. Then the education sector. Oh, the universities are, these professors are all subverting the system. So you go after professors and you try to control that and you, you try to say that in, a, in various instructions that they're not to teach certain subjects uh, and that they're not supposed to use Western materials. Of course, they can't, almost can't not use Western materials because that so much of modern education has Western materials. And of course, the Communist Party itself is a Western material, you know, <laughs> communism. So, so this is going on. And now lately, they well, okay, we can't stop. And we, we can't completely control public protest. We can't completely control NGOs. We can't completely control information getting around to stir up protests on the internet. And so who else should we control? The lawyers, the human rights defenders, ha ha. And so this last month or so, they've gone after, they arrested about 200 so-called human rights defenders as lawyers who take on human rights cases for all these other people they're trying to repress, okay? Arrest means what? They arrest them, take them off to jail, disappear some of them, some of them don't reappear in public, and others have been released. I, there's a young woman, uh, not very young, actually a middle-aged lawyer in China that came to Hong Kong and gave speeches recently because we have a lawyer's concern group there. And so she came to speak at that. Well, she's been arrested, her name is Wang Yu. She's arrested and dis we don't know where she's at. She's disappeared. And so they arrest these lawyers, human rights defenders, and they go after certain law firms that have lawyers who defend human rights, and they call them criminal gangs. Why are they criminal gangs? Because they're stirring up opposition to the government, and they allow people to protest outside of courthouses when they're conducting cases. Of course, everyone knows they're conducting cases to defend the people who are already protesting. You know, and they're not just stirring up the protest, but the protest existed. That's why someone was arrested and the lawyer was hired. It sounds very scary in a country where people are already 
to a significant degree educated about these things. Right. And they, they can see, they can tell a spade for a spade here. They know, they know what uh, Beijing is doing. So at the end of the day, Beijing is going to have backlash on this, don't well, they? Well, this is what, what we don't know. That's the, why the question, will China defy gravity? You know, because the regime is good at rewarding people, too. You know, economic development is stunning achievements in economic development over uh, recent decades. And a lot of people uh, are reluctant to go after that. They don't want to risk something they have to exchange it for something they might have uh, more idealistic. They've been compromised. In right, some way. right. So, so there's, I think the regime has a lot of support among ordinary people because it's basically provided a, a much improved condition in China from the condition, well, much of which, mm. which itself created mm. during hardline communist rule. You know, I mean, we know that from the Great Leap Forward in the 50s up to the, through the Cultural Revolution, over 40 million people were thought to have died unnatural deaths. So the Communist Party has blood all over its its. Well, sure, I'm sure people know that. Well, but they know that, but then they see all the new leadership from Deng Xiaoping forward has turned the page, and they're doing better things. It now, may be hard for people to accept that with, with, with right. all the information right. you're talking about. Yeah. Let me let me take a quick break, Michael. Yeah, okay. That's uh, Michael Davis, uh, Hong Kong University. Uh, he's here at the East West Center, um, and he's a public intellectual talking about beyond the Umbrella Movement here on Think Tech Asia. We'll be right back, you'll see. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Aloha, my name is Miley Scarpino, and I'm the host of the Empower Hour. If you're interested in health, nutrition, fitness, here on the island of Oahu, want to learn more about places to train at or different trainers available, then watch my show on Fridays at 3. We have a great time, and I hope that you'll come join us. Much aloha. Now go get swole. We're live. We're here with Michael Davis of Hong Kong University who's a public intellectual and can tell us lots about the umbrella movement and all the things that have happened since. And one of the things you talk about during the break is, you know, how, how all of this repression going on now in mainland China is affecting Hong Kong. It's like more of the same but worse. So how does that affect the people? In, how does that affect you? Yeah, it, it's crossing the border in a, a variety of ways. Uh, I think first in the early stages of the umbrella protest, the fact that the tear the police resorted to such extreme measures as tear gas and so on, I think was something uh, that may have been planted in their minds with by the Public Security Bureau in China. Uh, there were rumors that police were receiving training there, but I don't know if that's true. Uh, uh, that's sort of at the starting gate. But what I think happens is is there's a sense in this recent protest that Beijing was calling the shots. And so, the, so Beijing seems to have dug its heels in and it, in effect, decided the Hong Kong government wasn't bad enough, in, you know, rigorous enough in taking care of and in, in suppressing protest in Hong Kong and that they could do a better job. So in effect, they took over much of the decisions in, a, in their decision they made on August 31st last year about how much democracy or what shape it would take and so on. And they issued a white paper last year where they accused Hong Kong people have a lopsided view of one country, two systems, the model that exists in Hong Kong, 
lopsided and confused are the words they used in, in this white paper. And then they portrayed Beijing as Hong Kong's guardian of the rule of law and not the Hong Kong courts. The Hong Kong courts were said to be, judges were administrators and were supposed to guard Hong Kong's secure, national security and so on. So all this is sort of a starting point. And then as these protests unfold, uh, there's a sense that, uh, in, in particular, a sense that, that because the leaders of the protest were university professors, that the and the students were from universities and secondary schools, that the education system had run off a track. And so there was these efforts to bring the education system to heel. And in particular, they went after my law faculty at the University of Hong Kong because one of the protests- Your law faculty. My, yeah, the University of you Hong Kong. You teach in the law yeah, school. Yeah, I teach in the law school there. And, and Benny Tai was one of the protest organizers, my colleague. Uh, another protest organizer was from the other university in town, actually, which I used to teach at, which is Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, and so th there was that idea that the students, you know, the student unions of the universities took the lead in the protest. So, oh, you guys must be getting it wrong. Uh, and so the chief executive of Hong Kong attacked a student publication. Uh, then there were attacks on our, there, our former dean, uh, he was, a committee selected him to be appointed as the, what they call a pro-vice chancellor. In, in Hong Kong, a vice chancellor is the president of the university. Pro-vice chancellor is the next level below that. The committee had recommended it, but then suddenly it was stopped by the university council, which is appointed by the government. It's the committee. And so everyone's accusing the, the, them of interfering. Why? Because the, this former dean, Johannes Chan, supported the democracy movement. And so, oh, and these law school, and that he is not running the law, he had not run the law school property he, properly because he's paying too much attention to democracy and not to the you know, business of the university and so on. And so then they expand the attack and all those professors up there, many of them, uh, I got mentioned among others, but you know, a lot of professors will be mentioned in our faculty are promoting you know, the wrong values. And so not, in the past few months. All in the past few months. And so just this week, in fact, uh, all of the, the law, a whole group of lawyers in Hong Kong now have uh, launched a protest against the failure to appoint Johannes Chan, even to this day, to the position he was already selected for. Uh, and the, the idea is to block him uh, from doing it. So I think this all created a perception that mainlanders and their supporters are leaning more and more on the universities, that the universities aren't doing things right. And they even got a kind, a guy who's known to be pro-Beijing, appointed to the University Council, and the rumor is he will become the new head of the University Council. So there's this, now academics are responding. Some of us formed a group and wrote, you know, a protest letter and petition for the government to stop interfering in the university. So you're getting this culture. And then at the same time, in the last couple of years, there have been several, Hong Kong used to be corruption free. But there are several cases now where our top officials, in fact, the head of the Commission Against Corruption is being investigated for having two suite of deals with mainlanders that, he, that come to Hong Kong and the chief executive for having sweetheart deals to have a nice fancy house in Shenzhen after he re retired. And so these kinds of corruption accusations are being leveled. These are under investigation. It sounds like it's being morphed into mainland China little right. by little. This is why the public is concerned. And yeah. the public, you know, the Hong Kong people can't be expected to silently sit by and just watch this. Not in Hong Kong. No, anyway. they, they go to the streets. And that's, Hong Kong is pretty feisty when it comes to that. But, but you know, this, this has to be closer to you now. It, this is the, the whizzing by your ears already. Yeah, you, right? you get a lot of that, but I, I don't know. My feeling is I just go, I try to be honest as a scholar. My specialty is human rights and constitutionalism. So I, my, uh, the media calls me you know, almost every day. And so I go on the radio and television and I you know, write op-eds and everything from the South China Morning Post to the New York Times. So you, you just go ahead. And to me, my feeling is that so far, free speech is maintained. I mean, we had a lot of intimidation of the press. And one, famous, one leading journalist was even beaten up by thugs, which they thought was the consequence of some uh, effort sure to, sounds like to it. please officials, if not directed by them. 
uh, on, from the mainland. Uh, there's no evidence that, that who done it. So, but what about your trip that you were telling me about that you went across for? For oh, lunch, no. you wanted to check and see whether you have any difficulty if you went into mainland China. Yeah, well, and what's the story? What happened? Well, we were, it went off okay. We were, I was going to take a trip to, uh, this was actually a couple years back, I was going to take a trip to Xinjiang, which is in the western, far western China, because I write on China's periphery. A lot of my scholarship deals with China's from Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang, now even written recently on the South China Sea. Uh, and so that's kind of what I do. And my wife said, well, before we go, and she's also a professor, and she writes uh, on Chinese uh, political change. She, in fact, writing a book now called What is China? Uh, and so this is sort of what we do. So we go over there, and she says, well, you better go over there for lunch before you go uh, to, before we plan a whole trip. So I went over for lunch and promptly got my passport stolen, but I had no trouble getting in. And in fact, it's recently, during this protest period, just, in fact, in December, I was, uh, invited to Beijing for a conference, and I said, well, I'll go if I can talk about Hong Kong's umbrella movement. And they let me. Really? So I went up there, and I, I gave, I said what I'm saying here, in Beijing at Peking University. Weren't you taking a chance? Well, that's funny, because my dean was on that trip, and he said, I kept looking at the door to see if the public security trip was coming. <laughs> but I was thinking, yeah, Yo, you know, you're a foreign guy. They're not going to mess with you, probably. You're a small fish, you know, in all of this. So you just, uh, you know, it's... It, it, that can change any day, though, It Michael. can, but I think the feeling that you have when you live... I've lived in, in Hong Kong and China, is, you know, for 30 years. The feeling is that this is something you can do. You know that a lot of your Chinese colleagues can't, and so well, they're more exposed than you. Yeah, are they're more it. exposed than you. Well, are. How does that work? Why would you be less exposed than they are? Because you're a foreigner, and and you're not really in a position to lead a public debate in 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 the mainland. In Hong Kong, you can be a voice that's well heard around in Hong Kong yeah. and beyond. But but in the mainland, you're just another howley. Yeah, just another howley, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and so I think. Uh, I think that's that's very much the case. I don't think it takes a lot. It takes a lot more courage for my Chinese colleagues to go into the same situations and speak up. Are, are they less vociferous about this than you are? No, they're, they're actually. I think many of the leaders in Hong Kong and the mainland are definitely Chinese, uh, very you know thoughtful scholars and stuff. Who you know in the same field that I'm in who write about these things, and, and I have great respect for them. And so if you can support or help a little, then it, it's something I think sure. is worth doing. Yeah. Sure. So what about the press? You know, you mentioned that Hong Kong had a great tradition of freedom of the press. We've talked about that before, yeah. and somehow it has remained inviolate through the umbrella movement and through the, the current troubles. Um, is it still like that? Is well, there's it still a lot, free? Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on the press. In fact, the journal, Hong Kong Journalists Association and Amnesty International uh, and actually the Foreign Correspondents Club to try to weigh on the other side a few years ago created a Human Rights Press Award. Actually, I, I, I won it this Congratulations. year. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, for commentary, but uh, and, and English commentary. And, and they create these award uh, to sort of have to recognize journalists who stand up to this kind of pressure. Because uh, it's hard to do, because it's not just about government interference, it's editors who want to you know, uh, make money with their papers and not offend mainland companies and all kinds of things that go on. Mm -hmm. So it, some things are, are you know, real fire. It's like journalists getting beat up. There's been cases of that. Okay. But other things, probably even more comprehensive, is intimidation of the media and a general uh, pressure on editors to self-censor. How, how would that work? Well, somebody, because you get blacklisted. You get a call from somebody. Yeah, you get blacklisted. I mean, the mainland uh, government has offices in Hong Kong, and their companies can be told, because they control state-owned enterprises. They control these companies. Uh, they can tell them what to do. And one thing they won't do, for example, is put their ads in the Apple Daily, which is the leading sort of newspaper that criticizes China the publisher of the Apple Daily even occupied the streets with his students last year. But it's one of the most widely sold newspapers in Hong Kong. So it's not, you know, just some, uh, you know, side the, But the pressure is clear. The no pressure. ads. Right, yeah. And you they need ads it, right, to, to survive. Yeah. And so uh, that's the kind of thing that I think that the more, that has been more of the story. 
But there have been these cases of intimidation. One, uh, Kevin Lau was the editor in the Ming Bao. And first he, he, he was changed, his job was changed. And I don't know if pressure was put on the paper for that. But then he was beaten up, nearly died. Uh, and then at our press awards, he was the featured speaker, you know. So, so that, what I think is, is striking about the Hong Kong situation, because it remains an open society, and it has a free press even if there are these problems, and it has a free, uh, you know, a, academic freedom even if there are these pressures. What I think is extraordinary is how many people stand up and insist on these things. When I sign a petition or I, I become one of the originators along with others, it's almost always one of my Chinese colleagues who started it, you know, and said, Mike, join us in this. Is there a dynamic on this? I mean, from the time the Umbrella Movement happened last year mm -hmm. till now with this kind of, you know, corrosive thing that's happening from Beijing, um, are people becoming less uh, vital on the issue, less interested in standing up? Well, there's uh, some of that. There's some of that. There, we call it protest fatigue. Uh, you can't just keep calling people to the streets, and then when you occupy the streets and cause such a sensation and block the main thoroughfares, people get tired of it. And they so, want to go to work and earn a living. Right, and a lot of the students felt a lot of pressure to pull back, and I think there was a lot of wise advice that you pull back and then you come back out, you pull back, you don't just stay out there. You know, Lech Walesa in Poland That's knew that. Advice. He could control his protesters, take them out and bring them back. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think showing that you can withdraw as much as you can come out is, is a, uh, a sign of power and control yeah. and support. Yeah, right. so, so I think the students were young and maybe didn't fully understand that. So I think they did kind of wear out public patience. Uh, and so at this stage, I think there's not currently any major moves to relaunch the you know, Occupy movement. Uh, this could come up later if matters get you know, more tense. But I think at this stage, there's more of this public education and so on. I, the people don't really want to protest. They would like to work with the government and come up with a solution to produce a government, uh, a fair electoral process. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but they see what's going on now and all these trends we've been talking about as threatening core values in Hong Kong, the rule of law, free speech, academic freedom. And that's what Hong Kong is. So you, you can't really remain silent in the face of that. So when people will be moved to come back to the streets, uh, it's hard to judge. I think there was some fatigue with that, yeah. but we'll have to see. Let me, let me take another break. That's Michael Davis. Um, he's a professor at Hong Kong University, and uh, he's here at the East-West Center. <coughs> he's a public intellectual there. And here on Think Tech Asia, we're talking today about Beyond the Umbrella Movement. And when we come back from this break, I, I'd like to ask him how he thinks it's all going to unfold in both potential directions. We'll be right back. Aloha. My name is Jim Sean, and I'm host of a show called Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Each week, live streaming at noon on Think Tech Hawaii, we interview people who have special insights into education from early education through K-12, all the way through higher education and beyond. Both public and private are areas we're interested in. We dig deeper. We try to find out uh, what it's really like to be involved in making change, advocating for it, how you reform, what people's philosophies are in reforming it. Uh, as I said, we're live streaming every Wednesday at noon on Think Tech Hawaii. And later on, you can find these interviews on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center website. We hope you join us as many times as possible. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm here with Michael Davis uh, talking about Beyond the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong, learning stuff that you don't necessarily know about, learning stuff that the world doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. know about, unless you really study it. And that, and that, I get this, you know, this feeling that after the Umbrella Movement, it got quiet. The press was not as interested because there weren't all the umbrellas, what have you. Uh, and now people are not as well informed about what Beijing is really about mm -hmm. and what Beijing is really trying to do to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. 
So, but, uh, but we have identified a number of vectors here, a number of possibilities, and I'd like to discuss with you in the, in the time we have left how they will play out. Um, you know, in, the, in the general idea that things are not static, certainly in that part of the world, they are always changing. The changes in Beijing, there are also changes in Hong Kong. Right. How will it play out? Will people in Hong Kong be more interested in representative government and in asserting themselves or less? Will, will, the, will mainland China be um, more repressive or will they learn to learn better ways? Uh, how, how do you see those two variables changing? Well, I think well, what happened at the end of the Hong Kong movement, of course, I mentioned earlier, was a, consult a second stage consultation where, which would then produce a bill that was put before the Legislative Council. Pan-Democrats vowed to, to veto the bill. Uh, under Hong Kong's rather undemocratic uh, legislative election process, uh, Democrats typically get 55 to 60 percent of the vote, but because of the way the thing is structured, they wind up with just over a third of the seats. Uh, and all they needed to block the bill, because it required a two-thirds approval, was one-third of the seats. And they did. They blocked it. The government put the bill up, and it was actually ended with a bit of a bang, because what happened was the government uh, put the bill up and imagined that it would get all the votes except these 27 or 28 pan-democrats that would vote against it. But then in somehow in the process of voting, some of the pro-government guys got confused and said they're going to walk out because they wanted to wait for another guy to show up to vote on their side. So they all walked out, and then that, they didn't have enough of them walk out to block the vote going forward. So the vote went forward So with only eight people voting for the government's bill. After two years of consultation, they got eight votes in the Legislative Council, 28 against, and the rest were all absent. So <laughs> That's what, government by klutz. I know. And so it was such an embarrassment that after all of this PR and all of this effort, they got exactly eight votes in favor of their bill. Well, that and, does show you something, though. It's, it's, right. It's a little bit unpredictable here. But it also shows you that these guys are all hoping to take instructions from Beijing, that they have no mind of their own. Yes. And that basically they're, they're, they were cut adrift because nobody was managing them well enough. Uh, and so... Uh, and it was funny because then those legislators that walked out, some of them very prominent pro-Beijing people, uh, were crying in the media and saying, oh, I wanted to support the central government and so on. They weren't crying because they disappointed Hong Kong people. They were just crying because they disappointed the central government. <laughs> right. And, and it, so it, I, it was a horrible show. And it served the Democrats very well because they were worried that their obstinance, you know, because the government made this argument, well, maybe it's not completely free choice of candidates, but at least for the first time, five million voters can vote. You know, that's not a small gain, they argue. That's progress. Uh, and so the, the, the pan-democratic legislators were worried in the next election they're going to kill us that we block democracy. But now with the, the eight votes they got, <laughs> these guys who walked out completely killed the argument. And so now the pan-democrats, they were quite happy with that, that uh, rather messy Outcome. When's the next election? Uh, the next election, uh, there's a district council elections uh, in 2016, and then the next legislative election in 2017. So, so people will be watching. In fact, do I got it right? I, I could have it wrong. I'm thinking it's 2015 later this year. No, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I've okay, got, okay. I, well, what do you think is going to happen? Anyhow, two when steps. It, when it hits the public electorate. Yeah, and, and so we're going to watch. I mean, that's going to be one big sort of, uh, you know, like a referendum, if you will, yes. on this whole political process, how the Democrats perform, when, especially the Legislative Council election. They won't do well in District Council elections because the pro-Beijing parties have always been better organized at the district level. They've got more resources and they're better organized. So what will really tell the story is the next Legislative Council election. In the meantime... Uh, there's going to be a lot of political debate, and I suppose Democrats and, uh, are going to try to bring in more of these youth that were in the protest. So we're going to see that going on. And then I think the public would like to see the government side. I actually recently wrote an op-ed on this, that I, I think the government shouldn't just be happy, well, the bill wasn't passed, so we'll just stay in office. You know, I mean, they have to have a quote-unquote selection process, but they control that. So they, well, maybe they didn't want a democracy in the first place. But, you know, I think they, they have so discredited themselves 
that they would be very remiss to just think that, okay, this is over and we need not do anything else. It was blocked, we tried, done. I think they have to somehow do something to restore their credibility with the public. But I guess the point of all of that is that the people in Hong Kong are watching this. Oh, yes. They haven't stood down. They haven't right. turned their backs on the right. issue. They are as interested as they ever were right. in trying to hold on to this representative government idea. Right. In fact, I think if anything, if they don't go protest, that the government shouldn't be too happy. It should be disappointed because I think consistently all the way from the 80s forward about 70 80 percent of the public in hong kong have supported some kind of democracy when they stop supporting it in their voting and in public protest it's usually because they think it's futile that they just can't win so why waste our effort i don't think it's a good thing for the government if the public in hong kong believe getting what they want from our government is futile I don't think that that's something they should be happy about, that, the, that they've worn down the public so they're not going to go out and protest. They've got quote unquote protest fatigue. I think that that shouldn't be something they should walk you know, off and say, well, we won now, we're done. Uh, I think public apathy would be a very bad turn and would probably down the road result in immigration problems, all kinds of things. Economic problems. Yeah, brain drains. As you mentioned, uh, yes. a great financial center. Right. It needs this for vitality. Oh, yeah, the confidence that. in Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong, China likes to think that it's helping Hong Kong from time to time, but Hong Kong has helped China much more than China's helped Hong Kong. I remember meeting yeah. some guys mm -hmm. uh, at a party in Shanghai from Hong Kong, and to hear from them, uh, Hong Kong is critically important in funding capital for projects. Oh, yes, it is. And, and, and they're and very Akamai about how they do it. Right. And the rule of law and all those things is what makes that happen. Yeah. Because you need to be able to see beyond the corporate veil, to be able to get accountants in there and figure out what's going on. And that just doesn't happen with state-owned enterprises. Yeah. It, they can manage these things. So the other, the, the other variable, of course, is Beijing. Mm -hmm and, um, you know, the government in Beijing. And I just wonder what your thoughts are. Just looking at, assuming that nothing is static, it's all changing, mm -hmm. which way are they changing? From our discussion before, I, it sounds like they're not changing in a good direction, but how are they changing vis-a-vis -vis their position and their, and their strategies uh, in Hong Kong? Well, I think, it, in, yeah, you're right. In Beijing, the, the tendency has been to mo more repressive, more conservative. And I think on Hong Kong, so far, they've shown very little sign of bending. Uh, they, some people argue, one, probably the best argument would be, oh, they can't be, show any weakness because if they do, then other parts of China, you know, sort of the uh, domino effect will also demand the same things. But I think actually if they handled this in a sensible, quiet manner, allowed Hong Kong to have what's been promised it, I don't think this will cause a domino effect. I think most of China has come to accept that Hong Kong is different, just like they accept that Japan is different, the United States is different, that there are places in the world that have different systems. And the one country, two systems model, I think, was sold so well to the public in China that that's not going to be what turns China into revolution. It may well be the public in China will be fed up with a Communist Party, but I don't think it's going to be caused by Hong Kong. But I think there are things working. Let me throw my theory at yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, so right now they have a, had, they are having a crash in the stock market. Right. And that's probably going to have a secondary effect because they haven't used good financial strategies right. to ameliorate it. Uh, it's probably going to have an economic effect on right. the country. And therefore, in China, an economic effect on the country you know, destabilizes or, right. you know, uh, withdraws support for the government. So now the government is less confident, okay? Right. At the same time, you have this problem in Hong Kong, which the press has not really attended to of late. Uh, and if the press looks carefully, the press will see that not only do we have this financial problem going on in China, but we have the problem in Hong Kong was never resolved. Right. And they, and they will see, you know, the repression and they will, they will make very negative right. statements about China's future, right. which will further uh, exacerbate. What about my theory? I think that's about right. And I, th I think what's, what's uh, I, the other night over dinner, it was talk about this, and, and someone pointed out a common argument that, well, the Communist Party provides stability. 
and all these protesters are destabilizing. But, you know, this is kind of a fake stability, and, and the indication of it is all this money coming out of China. Chinese people aren't stupid. If they, this government were viewed as stable, they wouldn't be putting their money overseas in less lucrative investment climates. They'd be putting it here where they can grow it faster. But I think everyone's hedging because a government that survives by these repressive tactics is not really stable at the end of the day. Well, and I think that's the challenge, and I tell my students this all the time, it's the challenge for their generation. If you imagine the amount of change during our lifetime in Asia, then it's not hard to imagine there can be significant change over the next you know, 30, 40, 50 years uh, in Asia. And the students in our universities today are the people who are going to be a party to that. And so it's their choice whether they're going to be a part of a solution or a part of you know, just perpetuating this kind of rather unstable, uh, more risky form of government. What an exciting ride, Michael. Yes. It's it's, it sounds like it's got a long way to go. <laughs> That's right. And it's going to become more exciting all That's the time. Right. Exactly. Thank you, Michael Davis, You're professor welcome. at Hong Kong University, yep. public intellectual in Hong Kong, talking to us on Think Tech Asia about beyond the umbrella movement. And we have a lot more now to think about, and I hope we can connect up with you again soon. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'm going to spend part of the fall in India, but we'll see. You might want be might be interested in India. I would be. The fall is over. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>